Please be opening your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, Romans 4, verses 3 through 6. Romans 4, 3 through 6. In a moment, we'll be looking at that text. I would like for us this time to study the matter of the biblical doctrine of righteousness. In this sermon, then, we want to study how it is that a man becomes righteous. So that each should understand that while man cannot be righteous on his own, under God's great plan of salvation, his scheme of redemption, man can be accounted as righteous. We want to reinforce the idea that works of faith, of belief, of trust, of confidence, that is, of obedience, is God's way of making us righteous. And there is no other way. We'll have more to say about that as we go through, but now let's turn to Romans chapter 4 and read verses 3 through 6. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now we must keep in mind in this passage that Paul is having in mind the works of the law of Moses over and against the gospel system, obedience to the truth as it is in the gospel. With that said, then let us look at the text and emphasize some important points. You know, I think, if you keep up with things and study as you should, that there's much misunderstanding and error regarding the subject of righteousness throughout the religious world. Those that believe in Christ as the Son of God. The word righteous, at its very foundation, simply means correct. The word righteousness is the state of having been found correct. And most of the time we don't use the word in common speech except to impugn someone's arrogance by saying, well, you're self-righteous. It's a sad thing that we only use it for that so many times because it is a very wholesome word, but it's become somewhat archaic and thus not in modern English as it used to be. We use the word almost consistently and regularly and exclusively in the context of religion. But originally, it was used simply to describe one's correctness in relationship to another. For example, a person acquitted on legal charges was said to be righteous. Also, in acting toward one's fellow man, if one did good deeds, I say in acting toward one's fellow man, one was said to be righteous. The problem comes in describing someone's relationship with God. How can we say that man can be righteous before God. And God remained the completely just God that He is, seeing that man is a sinful being, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, or separation from God, Romans 6.23. Clearly, one cannot, upon one's own personal merit, be acquired or be acquitted of the charge of sin. Can't do it. Equally obviously, one cannot upon one's own merit have good deeds accounted righteous before God. And that's the very burden of Paul in Romans 4, 3 through 6 that, we, that we've noted. Now, let's discuss this business of righteousness and especially counting righteousness. 
of righteousness. Why do acts have to be counted for righteousness? Let me ask that again. Why do acts, your acts, my acts, have to be counted for righteousness? Why can't man just be righteous? Well, I already answered it. Because man sinned. Because man has transgressed God's law. 1 John 3, 4. And here's the point of that. One sin negates all righteous deeds that would have otherwise have proven us righteous. Once you sin, the whole body of law condemns you, and God being a perfectly just God then cannot look on you at all, no matter what other things you do that are correct, that are righteous, and accept them. Uh, look at what we have uh, over in the Psalms. And you'll see that this was on the mind of the psalmist in Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. We usually never get past verse 1 because of what it says, uh, but we need to get the full impact of what's being said by the psalmist, keeping in mind what we're studying. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now watch. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men, to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They're all going to sigh. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Well, that's a sad state to leave us in because it means we're completely separated from God and the blessings of God. We are lost in sin. But now in Psalm 143, 2, we also see and enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight no man living is righteous. Again, he makes it clear that no man living is righteous. And that certainly ties in with Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. But then in Romans 3.10, you see him echoing, the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul to write this. What was said in the Old Testament we've just read? There is none that is righteous, no, not one. Well, how can an unrighteous man be made righteous by per perfectly just God? He must punish sin. Man is a sinner. He must punish man. Well, because of man's sin, we see that he cannot intrinsically be righteous. Something else is going to have to take place because on your own you can't be righteous. No matter how much you want to be righteous, you can't be righteous on your own by yourself or any other group of men trying to come up with a way. Man's actions may be, though, man's actions may be counted for righteousness, now watch it, under the proper circumstances. Let me say it again. Man's actions, whatever those actions are, Man's actions may be counted for righteousness, for being correct under the proper circumstances. We want to know about that. Well, what does not get counted for righteousness? What does not get counted for correctness or righteousness? Right deeds that man does, thinking that these deeds will merit Salvation. That's a very important point, and most of the world stumbles at all of this. But let's keep in mind that Paul is writing part of the New Testament of Christ to those who have obtained, like precious faith, those who have obtained the righteousness that God would have them have. He's writing to the church. And so we need to understand that very point. So I've read to you Romans 4, 3 through 6. Let's go back over now to the book of Romans. And let's, let's look at Romans 9. Romans chapter 9. We'll look specifically at verses 30 through 33. Romans 9, 30 through 33. Paul asked the brethren in rhetorical questions, so he asked all of us in this letter to the church, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained. 
to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Here Israel was by keeping the law of Moses uh, seeking to merit salvation. They had the wrong attitude, the wrong approach to God, the wrong concept of the law. That's sometimes we don't point that out about them and their approach to God under the law. The law was perfect for, uh, for what God meant to do. It was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. But uh, they stumbled at all of it because they had a false concept of the law, of themselves as a people, of the Messiah, of His kingdom, and their relationship to everybody else. Well, let's hold that in, in, in mind as we look further into this. Let's look at some contrived systems of salvation that God has not authorized. And notice how he starts, Jesus does in his earthly ministry, with the Jews themselves. And watch what he says in Matthew 59. But in vain, in other words, being vain, it's pointless to do this. It's empty to do this. It doesn't accomplish what you mean for it to accomplish. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments, or precepts of men. Okay, with that in mind, now look at Romans 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And you see the disposition of the Apostle Paul, who at one time lived under the law, was blinded by some of the things we mentioned earlier uh, because he held certain views that the Jews held that were wrong under the law toward the Messiah, toward the kingdom, toward the law, toward the Jews. And so he's been in both places, but he did come to be enlightened by the gospel, and he believed and obeyed it. Well, now look at what we have. Here's his disposition. Here's his attitude. Being its inspired word of God, here's God's disposition and attitude toward the Jews, even in their sins. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Well, wouldn't that be our disposition of heart toward anybody? For I bear them record. Notice especially their, their attitude toward the law. I bear them record. I can give you testimony that they have a zeal of God. But watch it. Not according, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, God's correctness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, there's the problem, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Well, why didn't they? Now we're back to Matthew 15, 9, and the Lord's ministry, and His confrontation of them, saying, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. There's the problem. Now, they thought they were keeping the law. They considered themselves very determined to keep the law. Paul says they were zealous of the law. And I can give testimony to that fact. In fact, his own life, before he obeyed the gospel, was as zealous for the law as a person could be for any law. But notice, in verse number 4 of Romans 10, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. To everyone that believeth. To everyone that believes what? To everyone that believes the gospel. Remember what he starts out with in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. We'll get to some of that later too. But he makes it clear that the gospel is God's power unto salvation. It's his power unto righteousness. It's his power unto correct living. Correct religion. And we want to keep that in mind. Now I want to also turn with these points in mind, and see what Paul had to say in the letter to the Philippians in chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Keep in mind we're in the same vein as we were a moment ago. We haven't left it. He says, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, for what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. 
Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dung, why? That I may win Christ. And be found in Him, watch it here, and be found in Him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, the law of Moses, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Now that's pretty potent material there. Because he's saying when you try to come to God through the law of Moses, then it can't happen. Well, what does that mean about those folks who believe that it being God's law and didn't God give it? Yeah, he gave it. And he gave it for a certain purpose and to exist for a certain period of time. The fundamental workings of it was to bring the Jew to Christ. They didn't understand that. The end was the law. That was all it was going to be. The way the Jews were to God under the law, that's the way it's always going to be. Always going to be a temple. There's always going to be the Levitical priesthood. And so on and so forth. But Paul says, I've learned better than that. And I may point out here too that when he says, but that which is through the faith of Christ, he's talking about the New Testament system. The gospel system over and against the law of Moses system. The Jew rested in the law. That's all he needed. But he's saying they missed it. They didn't understand his nature. They didn't understand that it was something to lead people to the true source and way of salvation. And that's the whole reasoning he's doing here. James 1 and verse 20 talks about for the wrath of of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Remember, we're talking about righteousness from God, a way for man to be correct in the eyes of God, and God remain perfectly just. How can that be? You can see then that the wrong disposition of mind will not lead a man to believe and obey the gospel. That's what he says. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I'm interested in the righteousness of God. What does then get counted for righteousness? Well, first and foremost, Jesus' life was counted for righteousness because he lived a sinless life. He's the only man that could ever come before God and say, I merit heaven. Because I was tempted in every point, like as every other man, yet I never transgressed God's law. I never sinned. Now that's interesting, and we better be glad it's that way. Because it's our faith in Him. Because He was righteous. And He is righteous. It offers us salvation. Now, if you will, let's go back over to Romans just for a moment. Romans chapter 5. And let's look at verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous, shall many be made correct. Correct in what sense? Well, correct in the eyes of a perfectly just God. So when you study the biblical doctrines of justification, of forgiveness of sins, of redemption, of reconciliation, it all comes together in how God makes a person righteous. How I can become righteous. How you can become righteous. And remember, it's by the power of the glad tidings of Christ, the New Testament system, not the law of Moses. Notice what he says about the law. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might, be about, might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. 
that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace, favor, reign, rule through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, it's not the righteousness of the law. He'll say in the same book, For by the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. But men are justified in his sight. And it cannot be by any works of merit we've done. And he plainly says, it's not by the works of the law. Must be by something else. And that's the point we want to keep in mind. You can also find matters said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 along that line. It is through Christ that we may be counted righteous as well. And that's a very important point. How? Through Christ. Through is an avenue. Through Christ. Christ is an avenue. That we are able to be counted righteous or correct before God by a sinless God. A righteous God. A just God. When we deserve damnation because we've all sinned, we can't do anything to merit heaven because once sinned, we're under the condemnation of sin. Make it every time what you want to change. On your own, you can't do it. You just can't do it. And the works of the law will not justify anybody. The law of Moses. So what are you going to do? Well, today we, when we submit to the will of God through Christ, then we can be counted as righteous or correct in His sight. Now, if you look in uh, Romans 6, you'll see this very point made. Romans 6, verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness, Obedience in order to what? Righteousness. Obedience to being correct from God's standpoint. Where God sees you as sinless. The righteous person is correct. The righteous person is sinless. But God be thanked that you were the slaves or servants of sin. Transgression is law. But you have obeyed from the heart. That form of teaching, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Well, what was delivered them? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. In other words, when you became free of the guilt of alien sins that separated you from God, you were baptized for the remission of those sins. You were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. The Lord added you to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ, Ephesians 1.3. Thus, you're now viewed by God as righteous because of your trust in Jesus who paid it all as a sinless person on the cross. So being then made free from sin, you became the servants. Now your goal is to live by faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. To live by belief, trust, confidence in God through the teaching of the New Testament. The life that God would have us live. And that's a great point that sometimes just gets overlooked. So it is through Christ that we may be counted righteous as well. These are acts of faith. Well, what's an act of faith? You mean to tell me that David, in keeping the law, wasn't showing his faith in God? Well, that's not the point, is it? It's the whole body of the law of Moses that can't do what the gospel system can do. The Jew didn't understand that. And he bore record they were zealous for the law. Paul did. But uh, the law in and of itself, rightly interpreted, or they're going about to establish their own way of doing things, thinking they were keeping the law, uh, none of that could make a person what he ought to be. Well, what would do it? Faith in Christ. Why faith in Christ? Because he did live the perfect life. He was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus he could go to the cross and offer his own body a sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Now go back and read Isaiah 53. And you'll see that the prophet basically in summing up that chapter is saying... Everything God ever wanted is in Christ, and He offered His life, sinless as it was, 
And because it was sinless for everybody's salvation. Now, I can have faith in Him. I can have faith in Him because I have His terms of pardon in the New Testament. I can trust in Him. It's not a work of merit on my part. I'm certainly not trusting in the law of the law alone, the law of Moses. It doesn't rule out the fact that the New Testament system is a perfect law of liberty, James 1 verse 25, but it's not the law of Moses. If it was, it wouldn't be a perfect law of liberty because it was never intended to do what the New Testament system, the perfect law of liberty, the law of life in Christ Jesus, have made me free from the law of sin and death. That ought to tell us something. And again, as you look at this, you might want to take a look at the Philippian epistle. And notice what Paul said to the church in Philippi in verse 9 of Philippians 3. Philippians 3, 9. And be found in Him, that's in Christ, where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1, 3. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Law of Moses but that which is through the faith of Christ, and that means the system of faith, that is the New Testament system, the perfect law of liberty system, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which made us all free from the law of sin and death, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's exactly what he's talking about. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now David and all the other worthies of the Old Testament, though they were under different systems, such as Noah was never under the law of Moses, and David never was under the patriarchy, but they both approached God based upon His Word or by faith, for faith then came by hearing the Word of God even as it does now, and it always has, Romans 10, 17. Just a different law for those people under patriarchy and those people under the law of Moses from what we're under today. And let's look at this. Let's look at Noah. Now notice what we have said about him. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. Noah was a righteous man. Noah was a correct man. Noah's righteousness did not preclude God's favor or grace. Genesis 6 verse 8, Noah found grace in God's sight. Noah's righteousness did not preclude God's covenant. If you look in Genesis 6 and verse 18, you'll see that. Then Noah's righteousness did not preclude God's commandment. Genesis 6 22, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now look what you've got. You've got him being a correct or righteous man from whose perspective? From God's perspective. It's a spiritual perspective. It's a state of sin being removed perspective. God's favor was involved in all of this. God favored him. God's grace. There was a covenant there. None of that precluded any of the others. Then we are able to see that God's, uh, Noah's righteousness did not preclude God's commandment. It was all involved in it. Yet, in modern religions today, you have the idea, where there is a system of grace, there could be no law. Well, it was in Noah's day. Where there's a law system, there's no system of grace. Well, did we read back over there a while ago in the last verse of Romans 5, that grace reigns through righteousness? Well, it can't be the law of Moses because no flesh should be justified in his sight by the law of Moses. It can't be my meritorious works because nobody can be uh, perfect and live a sinless life. <laughs> Ephesians 2, uh, 8, 9, 10. Can't do that. Well, then how is it done? Through faith in Christ. How does that faith come? Through the gospel. So then faith comes by hearing the word of God. How is it then that a man can stand before God righteous? By faith in Christ, as the Word of God presents Christ in the terms of salvation that a man meets and demonstrates his belief in them by compliance with them. And neither one has to do with works of the law of Moses or works of merit. It has to do with showing my faith in Christ. Thus, I comply with his will because I believe what the gospel said about him, that he was perfect, he went to the cross, he died in my stead, and he tasted death for every man. 
In Genesis 7, 1, And Jehovah said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house of the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And notice what all involved. Hebrews 11 and 7, the writer of Hebrews, in that great hall of fame, faith, fame, said, By faith Noah, being warned of God concerning things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, through which he condemned the world, and became the heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. There it is. It's always been there. We just didn't know what we were seeing. Well, what about Abraham? He's pictured as the father of the faithful. In Genesis 15, 1 through 6, we'll not go into the details on that. It just simply tells us about God promising Abraham seed of his own. That a nation would come directly from him. And then in Romans 4, 1 through 8, when Abraham believed God, notice Abraham believed God, had faith in God, that what God told him was the truth. God put it down for righteousness. That faith of Abraham was considered by God righteousness. Now that's the doctrine of reckoned or imputed righteousness. It's not where Christ, we'll talk about it a little later, it's not where Christ's own life is placed upon us. It's our faith in Christ that He did what He did and the way He did it for the reason that He did it that I can never do for myself, which the gospel declares unto me, and therefore faith in Him leads me to comply with the terms of pardon. So Abraham's righteousness was fulfilled when he offered up Isaac. And that's what James said in James 2, 21 through 24. Abraham's faith became righteousness. Get that. Abraham's faith became correctness, became righteousness when Abraham obeyed God's commands and offered up Isaac. And that's not keeping anything to do with the law of Moses. Neither had it to do with meritorious acts on his part. Because all of sin, remember that, all already in a state of being lost. And once you're in that state, there's nothing you can do because the whole body then condemns you. And there's no good act considered once you become a sinner. Well, then how are you going to get out of that predicament? Nothing you can do. You can, on the basis of the truth of God's Word, have faith in Christ that He did what He did. That's why you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's why you have the book of Acts telling about people who originally believed in Christ at the preaching of the apostles who preached what went on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And thus, by the evidence, by the testimony, by the credible witnesses, they believed. And thus they responded. Now let's for a little bit talk about some misconceptions of righteousness and in doing so we'll refute a whole, a whole lot of the views that exist today. In fact, among most of those that claim Christ as Savior. And that is our, our first error is this. Man cannot perform a righteous act. Man cannot perform a righteous act. Not just as false as it can be. Romans 3 and verse 10, there's none that is righteous, no, not one. Well, doesn't that prove it? <laughs> Man cannot on his own be righteous before God. That's what God's saying. But when man acts upon faith, faith which comes by hearing the word of God, and in obedience to God's word, then he is acting righteously, correctly. God accounts such actions as righteous, not out of any merit within us, or any man, or anything we do, but because Jesus has authorized such acts to be righteous within His covenant. That's exactly why. And you have that Romans 6, 17 through 19. That's the very point Paul's making to people who had heard the gospel, who believed the gospel, who had obeyed the gospel. He reminds them that at that time they made a transition. They're doing what the Lord said to manifest their belief in Him that He can save them because He's righteous. The only one that's ever been perfectly righteous as a man. Now that tells us why Christ had to come to earth and be a man. Because He had to whip sin where man had been defeated. And He whipped it as a man. Thus we find in Romans, or rather 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, a passage most familiar to all of us, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect. It means spiritually complete. Well, you can't be spiritually complete through keeping the law of Moses. You can't be spiritually complete 
or righteous or correct by your own merits, but you can be spiritually complete by the gospel, by your reception of it, by your belief of it, and by your obedience to it. And that obedience is a response of your confidence in Christ to do what he said he would do. That's all there is to it, but of course that's enough. Let's now look at the false doctrine that says any work that man does is a work of merit and cannot be counted for righteousness, and that's most of the denominational world today. But Paul said to Titus, young preacher, in Titus 3 and verse 5, not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves. Now there's a qualifier. Which we did ourselves. Which we did ourselves. But, contrary to the works we did ourselves, according to His mercy, He saved us. Now what do you learn about the mercy of Christ? Well, it's the gospel of Christ. That's why it must be preached to all creatures. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When you receive the truth that's a gospel truth about Christ having died in your stead as a perfect person, then your plea is Christ because your faith in Him has led you to obey His will. And that's the washing of regeneration. You've been regenerated. This passage doesn't teach that every work that man does is a work that can't be righteous. It doesn't teach that at all. When we put trust in our own works, that is the key, or we create works to substitute for Christ's will, then we have created our own righteousness. And God does not accept that. That's the reason we're so concerned about the plan of salvation. And it's not by accident then that the great problem has been not at belief, not at repentance, not at confession, though there are error in all those, but the problem has been at baptism. Because man cannot see the connection between the thing commanded and the blessing given. However, when we put our faith, our trust, and obedience in Jesus Christ, then do these works, works of the gospel, guess whose works they are? They're Christ's works. His works of righteousness, which He's ordained through His will and not our own. That's why we talk about the work of the church. That's why we talk about the Lord's work. Elders are doing the Lord's work in that capacity. Deacons are doing the Lord's work in that capacity. Preachers are doing the Lord's work in that capacity. The Lord's the head of the church. He has all authority. Thus, we abide by His last will and testament. It's His work that's being done, not mine, and it's not the law of Moses. And thus, my confidence, my trust, my faith in Him, built because of the truth of God's Word, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that He is who He said He was, and that He did what He did to save us. Therefore, that faith leads me to take His Word as His Word and comply with it. But it's because of faith in Him. Faith in His name. Faith in His authority. Faith that He is the way, the truth of the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, why is that the case? Because He was tempted at every point like as we are yet without sin. And thus through Him, He's the only door. Because when God sees our obedience to Him, He sees us as righteous, as correct, as sinless. That's why. Because Jesus shed his blood for the remission of sins. If you have the remission of sins, then you have remission of sins. Your sins are remitted. You're forgiven. He does not hold them against you anymore. And if you live in the church faithful to Christ, then guess what continues? He covers you. The blood he shed on the cross that you contacted in baptism. And as John said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. That's how it works. Now, in closing, let me just mention the doctrine of imputed or transferred righteousness that I mentioned a moment ago. This doctrine states that man can never do a righteous deed because of his sin. So God must look upon Christ's personal righteous life in substitution of man. This doctrine doesn't take into account the fact that Christ's righteousness is not his own personal righteousness, but the system of salvation that Christ bought for man with his blood. That's what they don't realize. And there's a reason for that, because they're Calvinists, and they believe that God ordained everybody to be saved, though whether they want to or not, or everybody to be lost, whether they want to or not. And since you're inclined to no good thing at all, because you've inherited Adam's original sin, and you can't be inclined to any good thing, then how are you going to be saved? Well, Christ only died for those that were predetermined or predestined or foreordained to be saved. 
And so when they figure out by some emotional response that the Holy Spirit's tapped them on the shoulder and said, you're one of those God foreordained before the world to be saved. And if you were to say, no, I don't want to be saved, he'd say, you'll be saved anyway. Because God being sovereign and their viewpoint of sovereignty, then his will is overall. And thus they conclude that man must be saved by something God does on their behalf through no response on his part at all. And by no response on his part at all, guess what? I mean, there's no way a man can do anything in order to be saved. You can't even believe to be saved, and that's where their own doctrine flies in its own face. Because they say, well, there is one thing a man must do, he must believe. Well, not according to your doctrine, it's logically carried it out. You can't do anything in order to be saved because you bear Adam's original sin and thus you're inclined to no good thing at all. The gospel's good, so you're not inclined to it. And only those are saved who God foreordained to be saved in the first place. And those are the only ones Christ shed his blood for. And that's all foreign to the Bible, but that shows you how this leads to the same. Well, since I can't do anything that's righteous, then Christ's own life must be put on me. And that's the doctrine of imputed righteousness. But the righteousness that we're interested in is found in the power of God to save, which is the gospel. And that's why the gospel is good news. It means that Christ did for me what I never could do for myself. And by my faith in Him, based upon the word of God, the gospel, and compliance with His will, I have salvation. The truth, when man acts in faith and obedience to Christ's covenant, the gospel, God accounts that act for righteousness because one is trusting in Christ's covenant to be saved. And thus we have Hebrews 5, 9. Speaking of Christ and being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. So we study the doctrine of righteousness, counted righteousness, examples of righteousness, misconceptions of righteousness. We urge people not to be deceived by the denominational world on this issue. 1 John 3 and verse 7, John warns us about being deceived on anything when he says, My little children, let no man lead you astray. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now you can't get any more righteous on earth than that. You just can't. That's as righteous as Christ is righteous. Now, how could you be more righteous than Christ? Well, how do I attain that? You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God on the basis of the gospel message. You must comply with the rest of the terms of pardon, demonstrating your competence in to save you by repenting of your sins. Acts 17.30. Confessing that faith in Him before men. Matthew 10, 32, Romans 10, 10. And then completing your obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins. And when you do that from the heart, God says you're correct because you trusted in my Son who did for you what you could never do for yourself. And all of it comes together in Christ. And no wonder then that uh, Paul would write to the church in Ephesus saying all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. So have you been living righteously before God? Are you in a right relationship with Him? You can be if out of faith in Him, which faith, confidence, trust, belief is formed in you by the declaration of the gospel. And that faith becomes active and alive to where you will comply with whatever He asks you to do. And thus through faith in Him... You are made righteous when your faith is active and obedient to take him at his word and do what he said, the way he said it, for the reason he said it. And that's the way that's right. You can't be wrong. And on the day of judgment, all of those will hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. There is the law of man becoming righteous. There's the mystery of the ages revealed in the scriptures. How can a just God who must punish unrighteousness save people who are unrighteous? The Bible and the story that never grows old is that great explanation of how man becomes righteous. You're subject to the gospel invitation. We urge you to believe it and obey it. All together we stand and sing.